and we're live. This is Plant Daddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Stephen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening. We've already touched on carnivorous plants in earlier episodes because not only is this a really popular group of novel and unusual plants, many of which are really easy to care for, but it's also a group of plants that has really excited Stephen's inner plant daddy, even when he wouldn't have called himself that. Uh, Yes, this is where it kind of began for me in a real way. Yeah, so I grow a bunch myself, and even though I'm far less informed and experienced in this hobby and far less connected to the local carnivorous plant community... I do have to say that I was growing them way before you were. Um, Yeah, and you know, we we mentioned that a couple minutes ago when we were getting this sort of episode rolling, but I do remember having an ancient fly trap um, that, you know, my parents bought for me probably at some grocery store. I think or you something. talked about that in our pilot. Uh, did I? Yeah. Oh, well, you mentioned it anyway. as like one okay. of your really well, early plans. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. So that, that, that did exist. Um, it did instantly die, but I think we should <laughs> check the dates. Maybe that was before, cause I am a little bit older than, uh, than Matthew. So maybe, okay. So maybe it was sitting there bone dry, like in my parents' porch before you got your first one. I redact oh. what I said before. <laughs> Stephen is several years older than me and wow. he probably had his Venus fly trap Editing before. This, you can edit this all out. I may not have even been born yet. No, he'd have to have that plant when he was like born. Incredibly rude. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so... My first carnivorous plant was a Saracenia purpurea, and I didn't do very well with it. I was trying to grow it on a north-facing window. So Stephen has a lot of experiences that he wants to share um, about his own experience to help people out who might have been like him killing a Venus flytrap or me insufficiently caring for a Saracenia. Uh, But we'll get to that in a minute. First, Stephen, like, how are you doing today? Um, I'm pretty good. It's a weekend here. It kind of feels like a summer weekend in Seattle, right? Everyone sort of enjoys the weather. I'm just... Well, it was gorgeous yesterday. Yeah, it's kind of warm for here as well. Yeah, and I fairly think high humidity that. today. Yeah, so kind of that, like, uh, you know, I might take a siesta kind of day. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit overcast now. It feels like a good break. Yeah. It's... yeah how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I actually had a really nice, relaxed morning. I slept in more than I usually do, um, which is like 10. And (laughs) that is late for you. Yeah. Like typically if I'm not up and active before nine, I feel like my whole day is wasted. But today was good because I got up, I made a pot of coffee. Um, So I don't know if we've talked about this or if our listeners know, but I have three box turtles and they live on my balcony most of the time. It's like fenced in and secure, and it's kind of a little woodland garden. I think that we have mentioned that. But our first box turtle, her name is Bento, and she's my favorite, and we call her our little shell puppy because... (laughs) I've not heard that. A shell puppy. (laughs) Yeah, she actually... um, When she wants to come inside, which is regularly, she'll scratch at our screen door until one of us notices. And so then we'll open the door and Bento will wander in and then she'll hang out. She has a few favorite places. And one of them happens to be like right in front of the refrigerator because there's like a warm uh, air outlet down there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And so this morning while I was making coffee and toast, um, I was eating some blueberries some blueberries that had just come from imperfect produce and Mm. I don't normally buy them uh, because they perish so quickly and Brian doesn't like blueberries but I was sharing them with Bento and it was so cute while I was like getting my morning going sharing my breakfast with my little box turtle she's like 30 years old that sounds delightful it was really cute I felt like (laughs) Snow White but with more agency And imperfect blueberries. Okay, she would have perfect ones, I feel like. I, I did give her the ones that I wasn't going to eat. Oh. All right, Bento. I mean, hopefully she doesn't hear this for a while. Um, I don't know if Bento cares. Okay. I watched her eat a slug on the balcony yesterday. She's, <laughs> she's not very picky. Um, okay, so on before we dive note. into our topic, on that note, I just want to remind everybody that we can be found on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest at Plant Daddy Podcast. We're also online at plantdaddypodcast.com, where 
we have some various write-ups, and whenever we have really heavy, fact-dense episodes, which, uh, if you've been a faithful listener, first off, thank you, but second, I'm sorry about the Orchid episode, um, they are topics that sometimes we get like really excited about and there's a lot of facts to share. So I know that that's dense listening. Not all of our episodes are going to be like that, but I like to accompany those ones with write-ups on our blog so that you have all that information ready to access in like a written format. And I've included links to the American Orchid Society so that they have some cultural sheets for more information on specific types. It's a good resource. Well, hopefully it's a good resource. My intention is to make a good resource for you to accompany our blog if there's anything that you're particularly interested in that you hear in the podcast. So check that out. And I just want to say, too, I think that, you know, that's the way that you're interested in these plants. Um, And I think that was clear in that episode, too. Right. So that was not some like, you know, apology needed sort of situation. I, was, I don't think I was literally the kind of little there. kid who would read the encyclopedias for fun because I love learning yeah. things. I love knowing things. And so for me, like part of the plant hobby is knowing all of these things. Um, and I love to share that. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for some of that occasionally. <laughs> now, we can also be emailed and contacted by any of those social medias, but we do have an email address. It's plantdaddypodcast at gmail.com. Very easy to remember. Uh, be in touch with us. And also, we would really love it if you could please rate and subscribe if you enjoyed some of our early episodes. Um, I do want to mention, though, that this is the first episode that we are recording after we already have episodes out and available for people to listen. So it's kind of exciting for us since like we're now at the point where we're recording and we have listenership. Um, And I do want to just point out that uh, it's really gratifying to read some of the comments that we've received. Like for instance, we were informed that we have sultry voices Which I never really thought about before, but I suppose that that is perhaps true. Yeah, I have literally never heard that. I feel (laughs) like they're talking about you, but I'm going to also jump in on that too. No, I don't don't hate it that much. I just, I mean, when, when we listen through some of the episodes, I will say that I react without filter in front of Matthew. Okay, so. It's really cute. I almost feel like recording a YouTube video. Because we're also on YouTube, where you'll find our episodes recorded, uh, just audio tracks. We also have some various like tutorials and stuff. The only one right now <clears throat> is about growing orchids and repotting and mounting them. But uh, maybe someday I'll sneak in a video of Steven cringing and thrashing around. Actually, yeah, this is not a bad idea. Okay, like we were thinking, oh, we put the episodes on YouTube. Actually, we should just put episodes of us listening to the episodes Mm -hmm. and cringing because actually that might be more entertaining (laughs) Uh, yeah anyway a lot on our plates Uh, so steven anything else before you want to get us started on our topic today um you know not really i was gonna maybe share more plant news but it's kind of the same plant news it's my it's that brassavola orchid this is my favorite ready to open it's like partially open but you know there's a part of that bud that is still stuck together yeah so i might help it along the flower is open but still unfurling and within the next few days it's gonna smell like a tropical paradise in here because they have such amazing nighttime perfume and i'm thinking if it's these you know slightly warmer nights or maybe more humid nights it'll be intense yeah so i'm excited about that how about you matthew uh well i'm excited about your orchid okay um (laughs) i did mention this a few episodes ago but my uh pino ceris gregii the night blooming ceris Mm -hmm. from the sonora desert uh she is finally like properly woken up that new bud that i saw on her is starting to grow you can see like distinct ridges and spines now so i'm really keeping my my fingers crossed also, I have this orchid. It's called a butterfly orchid. Um, there are a few that go by that moniker. But this one is Psychopsis Mendenhall. And it has thick, fleshy, green, kind of olive green leaves that are mottled with purple spots. And they have thick pseudo bulbs. Mm-hmm. But they have this very tall, long flower stalk. Um, Stephen just pulled up photos, which just shows automatically that the name Butterfly Orchid applies to many of them. Yeah. Um, but this one has one single flower that it holds on top of a very long stalk. It kind of looks like a butterfly. Its two upper sepals 
or sorry, it's it's two upper petals and its highest sepal are long, thin, narrow. The lower two sepals and the lip are like ruffled and are innate and they're kind of mottled shades of like orange and brown and yellow. Yeah, it's kind of like this brown and sort of ochre like tie-dye effect, I kind of think. Yeah, honestly. it's really pretty. And something yeah. about this orchid that's uh, fun and original is that that flower spike will continue to bloom for a long time. So each flower lasts a few weeks and gives you like a long show, but then after it fades and falls off, a new flower begins to develop directly behind it. Oh, so you kind wow. of end up getting like this chain of sequentially blooming flowers. So this plant has been on and off in bloom for months. Yeah, because like, I've seen this this flower before yeah. at your house. Like every time that it flowers, I'm really excited, even though it's okay. like pretty commonplace by now. But it's one of my favorite orchids. It's really pretty. And very I got cool. it at Seattle Orchid. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think we're then ready to dive in. So I, you know, we touched on that, like we kind of experienced some of these interests a bit differently. I was going to kind of take you through why I like these and sort of my journey. Um, and it might be a little bit less fact heavy, but uh, yeah, maybe, you know, this approach is just as enjoyable. So for me... Um, this is really the core of my plant interest, I would say. So this, these are the ones that I, you know, got interested in how to care for them. Then I got interested in what others are related. And it kind of led me down this chain um, where I just, I found myself, you know, thinking about them when I was at work a little bit, right? And then, you <laughs> know, doing about the research. Jewish. Yeah, I don't go <laughs> quite that far. Um, that will be a special episode for Matthew, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I get distracted yeah. and just trail off into my own thoughts. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, for me, like, so, you know, what what makes them so interesting to me? I think there's this piece where they just do something more than many other plants. Well, let me just interject. Like, that's um, the coolest thing about them is that they're, like, savage. They come from these, like, really resource-depleted areas, and so they have to find a way to get things like nitrogen and yeah. so this is a trait that's developed numerous times over like the history of earth in many unrelated plant families like some of these are not yeah. closely related at all so it's a great mechanism for improving your viability in a setting that lots of plants can't succeed yeah and i think for me it's not even necessarily this it's so savage kind of part look at it eating it um I, yeah you know that at some certain points is sort of impressive, right? I kind of want to start singing songs from Little Shop of Horrors right now, but uh, I won't. Yeah, and you know, it, it, I, I guess, too, it's like I didn't see Little Shop of Horrors and then I got interested, and I don't know if I've met anyone who has. <laughs> uh, who, who, who got interested because of Little yeah. Shop? You did? No, but I'm sure that those people exist. Oh, I'm sure they do. Yeah. But I'm like, you know, is that the norm for this hobby? I don't really know. And I mean, we can kind of get into this over the course of the episode, but I do feel like there are thoughts projected on, you know, the hobbyists in this community as mm -hmm. well. Because right? oh, I feel yeah. like they're a little bit, it's a little bit of a separate thing sometimes. Anyway, so why, you know, why do I like it? I think they do something more. It's, I mean, some people, it's kind of like... Maybe it's a parlor trick or something, right? Like, oh, look, it uh, snapped on that fly. Okay, if you touch here, it'll, it'll close. There's but something cool me, about plants that move on their own like they actually have, like, some animal mechanism in them that definitely. permits that. Yeah, I think that's cool. But I think here, I, I feel like you're witnessing this process that, you know, exists in other plants, of course, in other ways, right? But you sort of witness digestion. Right? Yeah, or you feel very involved, or you feel like maybe in control in some aspects of you know their feeding, right? Well, and um, like you can fertilize most of your plants, but there's nothing mm -hmm. quite as rewarding as taking like a little house fly that you've yeah. just killed and putting it inside of either like a pitcher plant if you just want to watch it digest down into like a little stew inside of the mm -hmm. plant, or if you want to put it in your Venus flytrap and watch it literally snap yeah. shut. Where I feel like, too, you witness this, maybe not witness evolution, but I feel like you well, observe we're... this super specific evolutions, right, of plants interacting with insects, outwitting insect brains, right? <laughs> so with these different me mechanisms, you're like, okay, well, 
the plant kind of knows that at night, you know, certain crickets like to maybe hide in these shapes. I find on my balcony, mm -hmm. um, my fly traps catch, catch a lot of crickets that are kind of those green, like grasshoppery crickets. I sort think of they're looking. like little Katie dids. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's that's right. Um, so a lot of those at night are caught, and maybe they're you know hiding in there, resting in there, or something. Right? Yeah. Um, or, you know, with Darlingtonia, which I, I feel like we keep bringing up in this podcast, there's these fenestrations, right? Then, and there's a bunch on my balcony right now that are mature for the first time. I just watch these yellow jackets doing the most, I feel like, just idiotic things, <laughs> right? Like, they're like, oh, yeah, well, right in here, they will crawl into these tiny nooks and crannies. Um, so, on one they're, hand, they're we do know that yellow jackets are among the smartest animals on the planet with very high IQ, but also, like, this <laughs> speaks to, um, no, I'm kidding about that. Oh, I was like, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because these, these traps, they're all developed specifically to lure and attract insects. So, it's like this perfect... It's almost like the plant understands what an insect oh, wants. Yeah, but and like then it a five it. stage, you know, sort yeah. of trap, some of these. And then and then and this is a species that has no motion even. Right? So they're like, okay, we're gonna put a little bit of nectar here. Um, we're then going to, you know, put a fenestration here. It's gonna walk around a little bit. And then it's going to try to exit a different way, maybe, or it's gonna smell something like further down. Then we're gonna put these other hairs here, right? So I think it's so kind of interesting to see. And then some escape, right? Or then, you know, as you read even a little bit about these, I mean, the rate of capture is extremely low for a lot of these plants. But I've also but, had Saracenia that have had so many yellow jackets oh, and yeah. house flies inside of them that the leaves literally get nitrogen burn and die back. Oh, yeah, totally. And they don't they don't need to catch, you know, yeah. even 20%. Right? Now, like, something that I want to say about the Venus flytrap, because... Um, I think this is one of the best examples. It was actually, uh, Charles Darwin called it the most wonderful plant in the world. And its name, uh, Dionia Musipula, uh, is kind of in honor of Venus, the goddess of beauty. And it talks about how it literally seems to work like it has muscles. And so these, these attributes that make them successful in capturing insects usually translates to really high aesthetic value for us. So... The fenestration in the Darlingtonia, the colorations, the way that the traps have formed, they're really unique and beautiful. And so, sure, that's to the detriment of insects, but it also makes them really great in the hobby for people like us. Yeah, totally. And that's kind of another, another point for me, is that the forms are so different than many plants, right? So you can usually I think tell you can... if a plant is carnivorous just by looking at it. Yeah, and I think even, you're right, even if you're not familiar with, I think, these families, you're kind of like, you know, if you find yourself asking, like, oh, well, where is the, you know, broad leaf on this one mm -hmm. or something? And, or, you know, not that every plant has broad leaves or something, but but I think you look at a fly trap, uh, it's whatever, that's, that's the most obvious and well-known probably, right? But there's no necessarily like broad leaf part or with the darlingtonia you're just kind of seeing these strange you know kind of tube structures right mm -hmm. um so yeah the forms are really interesting i think they're beautiful in themselves i mean there's strange contortions that happen i think there are you know are leaves that you know grow pictures in them and some don't right yeah um, and different plants uh, I, mean, I, see, I mean, within the same plant, um, there's a lot of really pretty dews, right? Like on sundews or pinguicula, there's a lot of kind of shimmery looking leaves. And all of these um, are things that are like sticky or attractive. Mm -hmm. And like, we've definitely had parties where friends of friends have been there and, you know, drunk bros are like, oh, is this a carnivorous plant? And they're like attracted to them, even though they know nothing about them. But I have yeah. some displayed prominently in my apartment they are the ones that get comments on the most and it's like people who might not even be able to identify any of them know what they are and they're automatically excited about them. Yeah, and so I think too, uh, and, and movement is part of this, right? And all plants move, right, to varying degrees or will, you know, interact with their environments, of course. But if, you know, a fly lands on even not a very fast moving sundew, say, Often the leaf will wrap around it, I think, in kind of a, a beautiful and interesting way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, beautiful 
in the sense that there's something wrapping around a dead insect, right? So it's not, I'm not saying this is like beautiful for everybody. It's beautiful in the way that the circle of life is beautiful. Yeah, exactly. So maybe not the lobby of the four seasons, right? But it's interesting, (laughs) I think. And there's, and really, there's many ways that you can fertilize these without, you know, loading them with dead bugs. So I think a lot of people kind of arrive there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think something, Matthew, you touched on, another reason for me is just how resilient these are and just the kind of, like, so nutrient-poor kind of environments that they grow in and, you know, all over the world. So, like, a beach, right, just kind of sandy and wet. What or, grows on a beach? So there's um, there's a lot of sundews that will grow in these kind oh, of beach environments. Okay. So I'm thinking specifically of, uh, like, Pygmy drosera from... Mm-hmm. Are they Western salt tolerant? Australia? No, I don't. So they're not. But okay. I think these are sandy, kind of wet environments. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, environments like that, or there will be some kind of nutrient poor, like seeps. Um, so that will be like Darlingtonia in, you know, kind of more alpine environments that mm-hmm. are the just stream size. Yeah. Or just, you know, this, there's these like water is constantly rushing through there. Right. Um, and at, this isn't really generally high flow, just to be sure to be um, clear there. But uh, water will be rushing through. There's not really much in, as far as nutrients. Well, and the really soil is like have to... decomposing granite, right? I think for some of these, yes. Yeah. Or like for um, pink wicula, they will kind of cling to rocks. And they grow and... in sandstone a lot, right? I, you know, I, I would say that there are some that do, um, but we see some, I, I feel like growing on like granite even. So there's nothing okay. even coming from the rock. It's just a place it will for them be to like, live. Yeah. Or there might be like little patches of moss or something. Okay. So and they're kind of like little lithophytic, epiphytic. Yeah. And I think certain ones really do benefit from um, like this will be kind of like lime content in the rocks. Mm, like they, so high they're pH. supposed to be more happy there. Yeah. So they're getting something I think from the rocks, but yeah. Um, yeah. These environments that really offer them very, very little, right. Where I think so many of us are used to thinking about plants like, okay, what can I provide them in the soil? What do they need in there? Oh, we need to fertilize it. Let's put this in the soil around them. Right. Like, yeah. But you want to kill a approach. carnivorous plant, like do that. <laughs> yeah. Kinda. So, um, that's a really interesting piece, a really different piece, I think. Um, and yeah, just thinking about how these developed, you know, many independently kind of around the world, um, and sometimes arriving at very similar mechanisms. I think that's really interesting. I think I approach this, you know, figuring, oh yeah, pitcher plants. Okay. Anything that has a pitcher, like it, uh, all came from the same kind of like, uh, dinosaur pitcher thing. I mean, I didn't, that's not my actual internal dialogue, <laughs> but I'm trying just to kind of explain like. I, I guess I figured that, right? But Yeah, but it turns out that helium flora yeah. from cooler areas of South America and the cobra lily, the Darlingtonia, the Saracenia, they're all traps that are pitcher formed, but I don't think they're very closely related. So I think for helium flora and Saracenia, mm-hmm. those are considered closely related. I don't okay. know about Darlingtonia, but I think an interesting one is that many people or many people I think I think it's thought now that there's a the king sundew, Drosera regia. Um, I think there's some thought that it's more closely related to Dianea, the um, oh, the flytrap, yeah. than it is to sundews. Interesting. Which I don't, I have not read about this extensively, but I think there's still some, you know, there's still debate like that going on. Now, Stephen or, has one of these right now that I was admiring before we started recording. It's a fairly large plant that looks a lot like a typical sundew. And it's just glistening. It looks like it was made with like Swarovski crystals. Yeah, it's so dewy. It's it, it really can get. I think the leaves can get to eighteen inches. Dang. Yeah. So if you give it enough pot, um, that's a really a huge one. And that's. I mean, I got that back when I was like, oh, you know, this will be my. One of my few indoor plants that I put on a table, and I mean, if you look at the table now, I think there's probably like 15 other things on there at least. <laughs> yeah. So, Welcome to being yeah, a plant daddy. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Do you yeah. want to tell me about kind of your transition through the hobby, like where you started and how you've grown? Yeah, I think this is something that, you know, maybe people who are just getting into the hobby can would be interested in, or people who um, have been in their, you know, are already plant daddies, I guess, if you, you know, have done this, you'll probably relate to, 
But like I've mentioned before, um, I got that Saracenia purpurea um, with Matthew years ago. I think that started it out, <laughs> and I won't recap all of that. But basically, it started catching plant. Uh, such sorry, catching insects. I was like, whoa, this is actually working here, away from its environment. What? Um, got more interested that way. Then I would say almost a year later, right, after I had some success with this long term, I then was shopping in a, a well-known store in Seattle, Indoor Sun Shop. This was, is where I got my first uh, carnivorous plants, too. Oh, yeah. so wait, oh, way back then, right? Yeah, they, they yeah. are... <laughs> so when I was a little kid, um, my aunt, who I have always been really close with... She lived in Seattle, and she would sometimes, like, take her nephews for the weekend or whatever, or, like, we'd come visit. Mm -hmm. And, like, every single time, she made sure to carve out some time for us to go to the indoor sun shop. That's, because, that's very cool. Yeah, they have always had the coolest selection of really neat plants. And mm -hmm. so that's where I got my first, uh, also, Saracenia purpurea, and a Nepenthe sanguinea. And I'd sometimes, like, email her and be like, Hey, Beth, can you go see if they have this? And, then, like, the next time that we saw her at my grandparents' house, like, she'd bring me a plant on, give her $10 or something. It's very cool. Um, yeah, Indoor Sun Shop is a really great local place for uh, most of your carnivorous plant needs. Yeah, so I totally agree. It's a, it's a place to check out if you're in the Seattle area. If you like Saracenia, uh, Drusera, Venus flytraps, like these are all plants mm -hmm. that you can get there. Yeah, so um, I was there. I then met another enthusiast. He worked there, um, this guy Bob. He's super uh, cool. Yeah, super nice. Um, really just was very engaging about these plants. And I ended up walking away then with a Drosera bonata that I got almost for free. It was super sorry looking, one of the last ones left. But I was like, oh yeah, you know, if it's similar conditions to this, um, this Saracenia I'm growing, uh, I think I could manage this. Um, I walked away with that. Then Bob gave me a, um, a small Penguicula hybrid that he was, that he had propagated. He brought it and he was like, oh, you know, it's so tiny. Just take it for free. Um, you know, let me know how it does. I think I, I ended up calling the shop a couple days later <laughs> uh -huh. to ask him about things. Or maybe we then already connected on Facebook or something. Um, so I was hitting him up for advice. I thought I bought my first indoor light that day as well. Ooh. So it was kind of, you know, some big steps there. Um, Steven got like <laughs> bitten uh, by this bug and like went hardcore into it. Yeah, so this was, I think the first, you know, big leap I would say uh, was that day. And then thinking, okay, yeah, like let's see how this, you know, how this does. And I think that when it's indoors, you know, if you have control over the light, right, then you can really see changes quickly, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that... What are some of those changes? Just growing, right? Um, so the Drusera banana that looked really sad, it perked up right away. Um, with the Pinguicula, because it has different forms, there's a summer and winter form, mm -hmm. it then started coming out of winter form. So I was really interested in that. It just the the dewy leaves were then growing from this mm -hmm. you know plant that looks like a little succulent. So the way that these are propagated, if you grow succulents, this is going to sound a lot like what you do. You might have something that grows in a tight little rosette, like a hens mm -hmm. and chick, or you know something like that. You pull off a leaf gently so that you keep the whole thing intact. Plant it in some soil or just like lay it on soil and it'll grow a little baby plant at the base as a way to grow a new one. And so that's what Bob does. He takes them in their winter form when they're like a tiny little hens and chick succulent with no carnivorous leaves. You pull one of these off, it then begins to grow into its whole new little baby plant. And there's this really dramatic change as they go from their winter form into their summer carnivorous form. Yeah, so, you know, it was really cool to see that close up. Um, and then, you know, on and on from there, then it sort of escalated. So I started doing research and buying these different plants on my own. I w did a trip to Portland. I, you know, I have some friends there. I go there periodically. I went to this really cool store called Paxton Gate, and there were some... They had some uh, carnivorous plants there. They had a Nepenthes sanguinea, the same one you mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, I then picked that up. That was the biggest plant I had uh -huh. at that point. So I'm like, gosh, where do I put this? Um, I think I had to then start, you know, start accommodating, you know, these plant indoors. I think it was the first time that I moved some books to make room for plants indoors, Ooh. which always feels like I'm like, wait, well... 
should I get rid of books, right? I mean, who gets rid of books? I mean, a lot of people do. I sound like a book hoarder now, but I... Marie anyway, Kondo this is a big so thing for me. Yeah, where I was like, oh, well, don't I want, you know, people to think I read books and, you know, where am I going to put these books? Anyway, so that it's... I think my place started changing a little mm -hmm. bit. Also, I got a plant that was mislabeled, <gasps> which to me, I mean, this is one of the first as a plant person. I'm like, hey... Uh, I think this is something different. That's I'm actually do some research. Yeah, that's really I, common and really frustrating, and it's not yeah. just for carnivorous plant people. Yeah, somebody that we follow on Instagram has been really excited about growing their own strawberries from seeds, hmm. and every single person who has looked at and commented on their photos is like, "That is 100% not a strawberry." And they're like, <laughs> "Yeah, I put strawberry seeds in the pot," and everyone's like, "Yeah, but." Look at it, it's clearly in the bean family. Yeah, so I, you know, then I think I correctly identified it as sanguinea. Other people agreed. I felt proud, right? Ooh, I think it's just yeah. part of this process a little bit. You're so informed. Yeah. Um, and then after that, uh, I then got involved with the carnivorous plant group in Seattle. Um, that's been really amazing in a lot of ways. So that's been a group of, or of really nice people, other interested people that you can talk about and sort of geek out with and not worry about overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. Which is important, I think, with a lot of our different hobbies, right? If you have some friend that has the same interest uh, that you know you won't completely fatigue, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that feels great. I think, you know, it's a group of people from all walks of life with I think is so interesting that kind of arrive at this hobby for various reasons. I've um, joined a few of these meetings, and I've got to say, like, it is the nicest group of people. They are all enthusiastic to share and sell cuttings and, like, babies that they've grown. If you have questions, you have this, like, rich resource of people who also have experience, mm -hmm. and they might grow them on windowsills, they might grow them in greenhouses. A lot of them grow them outdoors, um, even if just for the summer, but tons of them are actually hardy in the Seattle area. Yeah, which is so, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, and I would say, okay, even if you're not interested in these social aspects, right, which I think are, with, I think are great. I mean, it, you know, with this group especially, um, it's great to have access to some of these really, the rarer species. I think with carnivorous plants, many are available online, but there mm -hmm. are some, you know, like probably any, you know, group of plants, right, that are only really available a few times a year. Some just don't ship very well, right? So if I were to buy some, uh, some of these online, I'd be like, okay, well, let me ask around about this seller, right? Right? Certain, yeah. you know, many plants you can't buy over national boundaries, right? Very easily. Yeah. So, um, you know, you have access to this stock. I mean, often people will just give away plants for free, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of a hassle to, you know, sell plants, then deal with, you know, someone sold you something, right? And you didn't get what you wanted, right? Or it was damaged or something. How do you go back and get, you know, you can, you can not do all of that. A lot of people will just give away plants or trade them. Well, and a lot of people will simply run out of space, but yeah. they just have this attitude of like, I'm not going to destroy this plant. This is a marvelous plant that I simply don't have space for. Mm -hmm. So how can I rehome it like a yeah. kitten I didn't want to have? So, so I've gotten so many free, very cool plants. And, you know, often all it's involved is I'll stop by some, you know, brewery that's a few blocks from my house, like on Saturday or something with, you know, it kind of like gets me out of bed at a reasonable time. Uh, that's another story. Like yeah, that's a good thing for Steven. <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, I, I can walk kind of like drop by here. I can get rid of some plants that I would love to go to like good homes. Right. And I can pick up some really interesting ones. If I have questions about growing conditions in the Seattle area, right. Which well, is and that's specific. Gonna, yeah, yeah. So one of the plants that we're able to do here. Uh, that you don't have good luck with in a lot of the rest of the country are the helium borate that I was talking about. And these are all from these like high altitude plateaus in Venezuela mm -hmm. and they cannot handle warm temperatures. Like they just perish really easily if your summers get hot and they need high humidity. They never like to get cold, but they have really consistent conditions year round. And so like the Bay Area and Seattle are like the best places for them. And so they're reputed to be really challenging, but that's if you're trying to do them in like South Carolina, where you're gonna have them die unless you put them in like a cooled room. 
Yeah, and you know, it's it, that's one of those these plants too that the more I learn, the more varied people's conditions are. But you're right; yeah. we have really good, um, I think, environment for them here. I know several people just growing them outdoors in yeah. the summer here now, and that would which, never work in a lot yeah. of the countries. So this kind of speaks to it's useful to be in touch with your own local uh, kind of co hobbyists because. You might read stuff about how to keep them alive, but if that information came from a writer in Georgia, it's not going to be useful because they are going to be describing a completely different set of conditions that are successful for them. Mm -hmm. And growing them here, we're able to get away with different things. Something that I love about the carnivorous plant group, um, and I'm going to get into some stereotypes here. Orchid people are snobby. And I say this as an orchid person. Like, <laughs> they, they, this is like a thing that people say in the hobby. You go to these orchid meetups and people are constantly one-upping about like, well, I have this exotic plant. Oh yeah, well, I grew that and then it was, you know, easily uh, not my favorite when I met this one. And so mm -hmm. now I grow this one. But carnivorous plant people, they don't care if you show up with like a Fred Meyers, you know, anything small in a little cup that is marketed with, you know, a cartoon of Audrey II. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, they will try to help you be successful with that, and they will be happy to share ideas to be successful, whereas if you showed up with something similar at maybe an orchid group, you'd get laughed out and ridiculed for how basic and pedestrian your taste is. Gosh, I mean, all right, I've been to some orchid society um, functions. And, and this I've is not to disparage really, orchid people. Yeah, I just want to say I've met some really nice approachable people. And that brassicola I keep talking about, I bought from, I want to say the Orchid Society here in Seattle. They had they a sale. They were so encouraging. Yeah. I think I got a really good deal on a great plant. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm agreeing with Matthew. I The one that I went to... It was at the Center for Urban Horticulture right here, which is a great space affiliated with the university. It was an amazing auction. Wasn't it at Volunteer Park? Um, I, well, I went to a meeting there. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, actually, that's a different meeting we were thinking of. Oh, well, see, there's like tons but, of places yeah. and spaces that you can get these groups. Yeah, but what, you know, I was agreeing really that their setup is way nicer. Um, the plants that they bring, incredible totally kind of like show off plants which are awesome but and yes the carnivorous plant group i take i think an old amazon box and <laughs> i'll kind of box things up in foil right because many of these should sit in water they shouldn't dry out for a few hours really people will bring and, plants like yeah. in plastic red solo cups and quite and... literally yes we'll yeah. be putting them in cups or at this brewery we meet at optimism brewery like we'll get We'll just be like digging things out, making divisions right there. I mean, well, okay, let's let let's get a wet napkin and just put. I mean, it's it's so so relaxed as far as that goes. So yeah, um, and really, it's great. Like you know, both of those things are great in different ways. But it's I also love a great way to get introduced to things that you don't already know about. So if you just know the plants that you'll find at Swanson's or Indoor Sun Shop. Those aren't terribly rare. They're pretty common. They're pretty easy to propagate and grow. But if you connect with one of these groups, you can get some things that are at least similarly easy to grow that are much more unusual. Mm -hmm. And there's just this thrill to sharing something unusual to someone who's interested in it. Yeah, it's really on both ends. I mean, I would hope and I, I think it's thrilling to then just get a free plant. I mean, yeah. and ones that you know are healthy or you'll know exactly how to grow it half the time it will come in a setup that will work for a house kind of near you yeah right? and unlike when you buy uh i've seen pitcher plants for sale at one of my favorite local garden stores ravenna gardens they're definitely like very focused on like kind of the gifts and flowering plants and like that side of things so it's a very different setup from indoor sun but if you ask the salespeople, like how do i care for this mm -hmm. saracenia flava hybrid they'll be like, well, we were told to keep it wet. Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely... Um, they don't have the knowledge say, uh, base as this carnivorous plant group. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's definitely um, a group of plants that have um, some specific needs. And it's not, I think, as difficult as some people think, but there are a few things that you kind of have to get right. 
Um, but yeah, so I think uh, this might be a topic for a future episode, question mark. But I just want to encourage people to check out maybe the, the plant group in their area. You can do this, you know, really sort of low commitment level. You can find them online half the time. There are online discussions. They'll kind of talk about their meetings or they'll just be, you know, there's, you know, other kind of geeks out there who can't wait to answer questions. Not all of them are, you know like late 1990s style internet forum trolls or something. Like there's really, there <laughs> yeah. are real people who want, you know, would like to talk to you about these and get more people interested to, you know, and find people who can take their, you know, plants. And, you know, I think it's something that isn't necessarily, you know, a millennial, uh, I would say instinct to like find a group that's meeting and like find a bunch of people and you kind of don't know who's going to be there, but I would just encourage you to try it. Um, now I, I do have plenty of millennial friends who participate in Facebook groups. There's tons of Facebook groups that are devoted to yeah. God, everything that you can imagine. And mileage may vary in how, of course, how yeah. much you appreciate the stuff that's there. Like before we started recording, we were talking about <laughs> how useful we find that. And some of them that I have joined and then left quickly were ones where people like share a photo of just the most like neglected sad plan that they got at Lowe's and they're like what is this well do you have google like <laughs> <laughs> okay so listen i i just said there are no trolls um maybe matthew's a troll okay um I matthew do was probably not... like that's a strawberry okay or something <laughs> it was not a strawberry it was probably a bean locust <laughs> oh, no but uh you, you know there, there is something that everyone's going to find useful for these uh, different ways of connecting. With yeah, and really, growers. it's as, it's as easy as just kind of googling this on Facebook, and you can probably find some open group and then googling just yeah, on just Facebook. Check it. Oh my god! Okay, we'll edit that out. <laughs> I hope. But no, we. Um, you know, you can just look on Facebook, you can see what the discussions are, you know, you can search, half the time your question might be answered already, right? It just, I mean, look and maybe take baby steps toward doing something like that. I, I, like, it's it's really an interesting, um, I think, way to uh, connect with people in the area, learn more about the hobby, um, and I will just plug, broadly speaking, the different carnivorous plant groups. Um, I think it's small enough uh, it's nationally. Definitely a huge community with like lots mm. of little chapters <laughs> yeah lots of little chapters um there are at least in the west coast there are some really cool local clubs so i've interacted with the portland club um well the portland guys come up here relatively frequently yeah, yeah. so um you know maybe there's i don't know some chapter close or something that you can check out anyway also and i keep seeing like the guys because i think that i have never seen a woman at one of these meetings. and there are women almost every time I yes. apparently only and go to I, the ones with men. Yes, and this is something that I'm mindful of, too. I'm kind of like, oh, because, you know, I think people talk about, like, oh, is this one of the more bro-y kind of plant hobbies Oh, well, it super duper has that reputation. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, well, let's let's make sure... What like, is the least is gay that you can plant? Or, or, or yeah. what is the most, like, gay-free plant you can grow? One that eats meat. Oh. <laughs> I have no retort. Um, um, I'm just I have to. Pro I guess I have to just think about that. Uh, anyway, yeah, I we don't want to. I hope this. it's not like that. <laughs> it's not. But um, yeah. So I, okay, where am I with this interest now? So I kind of you know took you through my life story a little bit with this. I think now um, I am past the point where if I see one, oh my god, I almost like have to buy it because I don't have that type yet, right? <laughs> I yes. Yeah. So and you may not, you know, think this if you're in my place looking around, but yes, I do not buy some plants. Um I think now I also enjoy growing plants that I've grown before just in strange conditions, right? So I'm like, oh well let me try putting this in a rock. I haven't heard of this. Would it you know, grow on a uh, pumice stone, say, and that's not a great example. Like that is not new territory exactly, but I mean, things like that. I'm like, oh, well, I haven't tried this in my space or, hmm, you know, could this overwinter? I'm trying that with some sundews now. And we had a couple um, frost this uh, this past winter and some kind of freezing nights. Um, I, I have did some have survived. some uh, Drosera capensis, which within the hobby, people love or hate this plant because it propagates quickly and fast yeah, and if it's you a grow great it plant that's a greenhouse weed yeah like it, 
if you grow this plant with other plants around it, it will show up everywhere. Yeah. I've actually had them overwinter mm -hmm. on my balcony before. Typically what happens is the the growing point, like the rosette of leaves, will die back and rot away. But then it just propagates from any of the roots that survived, so you'll get tons of little babies popping up in your moss. Okay. Um, yeah. So good luck with that. Um, yeah, you know, I... So I guess I'm doing experiments or something, I feel like, like that. Um, and I would say now, which is probably pretty common with any sort of hobby, right? Now I'm more interested in the rarer species, or I'm more interested in how my, kind of, my older sort of sentimental plants develop over time, mm -hmm. um, you know, in different uh, maybe pots that I put them in, or if I divide these and, you know, I give these to, like I set up a, a pot for my mom that is doing um, arguably better than many of mine. Weird. Um, yeah, it's kind <laughs> of like strange to then be envious of this thing this gift for her i mean so i might you know take it you're back. like i'm the know. plant daddy mom yeah and i'm you know try to gauge like whether she'll notice or not if i like chop up her rhizome and you know take some home but um <laughs> as yeah. someone whose mom's garden is full of plants that i have put there i totally understand yeah. <laughs> my mom has the most amazing peony collection in redmond <laughs> mm, yeah so yeah, you know, I think it's something that it's still probably the core of my interest in plants. I think it's, you know, the plant community I'm more, you know, most connected to by far. Um, so it's the, you know, these are the plants that I'll get opportunities to buy, you know, really cool ones that aren't for sale all the time. Or I'll get, you know, I'll, I'll know about trips happening to like this club or this garden or, you know, things like that. Well, you so, guys go to greenhouses sometimes. Um, yeah, so some of the people know uh, a famous grower around here, um, Jer Jerry Addington. He um, is pretty well known online or in, in Saracenia, particularly uh, communities really around the world. He's pretty well known. So his uh, greenhouse is around here um, in Stanwood. Uh, I've been up there. Um, super lucky to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so I think it's still kind of the core. I think then it led to my other interests in, you know, other types of plants that I've sort of touched on before. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the life story. Um, you know, we can get into another time um, how to grow these. I but, think I'm going to make that be our next episode, to be honest. Yeah, but this is just kind of what what this interest was for me. Maybe you relate to some of these pieces. Maybe, you know, there's some things that you heard and hear that you might want to check out within your own interest, right? Whether that's carnivorous plants or not. Maybe you want to try a carnivorous plant. There are many growers who are exclusively about carnivorous plants and they don't even mm -hmm. touch anything else. But I know that within the orchid hobby, the Nepenthes, which we've mentioned but haven't talked about, that's a, it's a tropical pitcher plant from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And they grow as a vine. And if you imagine how a Venus flytrap has like a long petiole, which is the, the section of leaf that attaches to like the stem portion. Um, that's kind of wide and thick and that looks the most like a leaf, but then on the very mm -hmm. tip, there's the trap. Mm -hmm. the, the Nepenthes are similar to that, but instead of having a short little stem that is like a tight rosette, like you'll see in a lot of carnivorous plants, theirs will vine eventually. And on the end of each leaf is a long, narrow tendril that comes out. And if the conditions are great, it'll end with a trap, which is this like beautiful, ornate pitcher. And there's a lot of really beautiful, exotic ones. Mm -hmm. And they love the same conditions uh, as a lot of orchids. Yeah, so a, a lot, lot of, of crossover. Yeah, right? like a, a ton of people who are like super into orchids or like greenhouse plants, mm -hmm. they'll move into that area. If you're really into like bog gardens and like that sort of thing, it's natural to move towards, you know, the hardy pitcher plants that grow here, the Saracenia. So... People get into this because there are so many different carnivorous plants that can like thrive under conditions that a lot of other plants do and on windowsills. So it's really easy to sneak some into the grow space that you have, even if you're into something completely different to begin with. Yeah. Um, so Matthew, I want to, you know, turn the table a little bit here. Um, do you have any stance on uh, carnivorous plants or what do you think of them i mean you don't have I support to have them any. yeah you know i think <laughs> and i ask it that way because i think there are some people who like are kind of annoyed by them or think they're kind of gimmicky somehow or like oh you know i don't need to have a plant that like 
bites a fly, right? Well, um, I am not that person. Yeah, I mean, do these do these plants stick out for you in any way? Absolutely. I think that they are fantastic for a couple of reasons. One of them is just, they are so novel. I love a plant that is unique and that has some attributes to it that you don't see in other plants. So like broad leafy tropical houseplant foliage, that's beautiful. It's like a gorgeous background, gives you hashtag jungle vibes. Yeah. But the carnivorous plants, um, they're just so different and they might not thrive in the same conditions that a monstera would or they might not be the right plant if I just want like to have a lush look in my home. But I love having them as like little kind of like special moments throughout my plant curation. I, mm. well, so I already talked about the background that I started with, like the, the temperate Saracenia pitcher plants. Mm -hmm. I thought that they were beautiful. Um, they have such unusual pitchers and they're usually really interestingly colored. The purpurea can be green, it can be dark reddish purple, it can be green with like striations and veins in different colors. Mm. The flowers are really unique. They grow in these long stalks and they kind of look like umbrellas with yeah. like these elaborate plumes. And there was just something so special about those that it just captured my attention immediately. And the Venus flytrap is just such a wonderful little novelty. The sundew are beautiful because they are usually green with red and they have little hairs that stand up on the leaves that are just like glistening with a sticky dew. Watching them slowly wrap around an insect that's been struggling to break free but just gets more and more stuck as it struggles until it's like smothered. Um, the so you're saying that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> circle of life beauty. <laughs> yeah. I love watching flies die. Mm. Um, actually, I have an electric fly swatter, and Brian and I will sometimes just like go on a mission to kill house flies. <laughs> <laughs> so our balcony is a little bit sheltered from the wind, and we're on like the apex of Capitol Hill. So third story, we get a lot of wind and exposed area, and I think the flies just kind of get trapped there. Like, as they come around. Yeah. And so I've got a bunch of hardy pitcher plants on my balcony, and they're growing in a large bowl. They've been there for a few years. I also have some individual pots of special species that aren't just, like, general hybrids. And they do such a good job of capturing yellow jackets. And since Brian is allergic to bees, this is, like, both form and beauty. Mm -hmm. And... um. What I wanted to say, uh, kind of about what I feel is really special about this hobby and these types of plants, is that they they have so many unique forms. It's the Nepenthes that really captured my heart. Um, there are so many different species of them and so many hybrids of them, and that's been one that I have really been, well, struggling is not the right word. I haven't had the success that I want, because a lot of these prefer higher light and higher humidity than I can easily give them without really altering my space. So that's sort of my current challenge mm -hmm. in the hobby is getting my Nepenthes to do like the best that they can. And there's so many types that I would love to grow that I just straight up need a greenhouse for. Yeah. I have had really good luck with a lot of the varieties that are very easy to find places because these are easy to propagate, they're easy to distribute without them dying. So those ones are, are wonderful. I just think that they are absolutely stunning and their beauty rivals like any other plant. Yeah, you know, really as a group, I think, I think it speaks to the diversity and really how we think of maybe carnivorous plants as one thing and they're kind of not, right? So like you, there's no place on earth really that I know of where all of these grow super, super well. I mean, okay, maybe Hawaii, right? Because, like, everything grows super well in Hawaii. But, but <laughs> it's like you're saying, no, right? but, like a, but a cool night. Anything that needs to have a winter dormancy would not grow in Hawaii. So, yeah. yeah, like, tons of these actually are from temperate climates, and they have to have a cold rest period. Yeah, so... so well, and, and so that's one of the things that I find interesting is that there are some that I can just leave on my balcony and as long as yeah. I keep them wet and in the brightest sun I can, they will thrive with very little interaction on my part. Yeah. Others need to be protected from cold. I Some that are marginally hardy, I might move into a slightly more sheltered winter position. I can't yeah. do that with my Nepenthes. 
I have a few pinicula that I got from Steven uh, and also the Indoor Sun Shop. And I'm growing those in little pumice pots that sit in a dish of water. And they've been doing so well. And that's the type that I've never really been very inspired by in the past. Mm-hmm. And Steven totally, like, infected me with that one. But they they haven't really gone dormant for me. They're mostly all in their, their summer growth. Some of them bloom. And, well... Yeah, which is... It's a little bit more difficult, so you should feel good about that. Well, the one that blooms the most has these, like, neon magenta flowers that I really don't like. I, <laughs> I, yeah, it's I don't like that blooming. color. It's ugly. <laughs> yeah. um, but I have one with, like, this deep violet flower. I have one that has tiny little white flowers with purple striations. And just growing a carnivorous plant for its flowers is sort of unique, even though a lot of them have beautiful flowers. But the yeah. panicula to me are the one that they almost look like little primroses. They've kind of got that that shape, mm-hmm. that style to them. Their leaves are gorgeous when you have cool nights and high light. Some of them become pink. Some of them become purple. A lot of them will be green if they're not under like the highest light Mm -hmm. or with the nice cool temperatures that'll bring out the most of their color but it just shows that you can be successful with a lot of these in a lot of different ranges of cultural conditions yeah um so i think that's kind of it for my um carnivorous plant story and journey yeah and i I don't really have anything else to share so as usual um there's a pinterest board uh just look for us as (laughs) excuse me plant daddy podcast And I've included many photos and growing instructions for all the carnivorous plants that we talked about in today's episode. But there's also like little subboards on each of those that divide them out by their genera. So that if you're curious about anything that we've talked about and you want to see what it looks like, you'll find it. We've also included a bunch of boards for some of the more unusual ones that we didn't touch on, including some that Stephen and I do not grow, haven't grown some I won't grow, <laughs> but you'll be able to see like the different kinds of trap mechanisms, the different forms, the colors, the flowers. Uh, so yeah, check it out. Go take a look at that. Um, conveniently, many of these are really easy to grow, so it's a great way for you to get a little bit more excitement and savagery into your garden. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Stephen, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, No, you know, I think I'll include some um, information about the different uh, carnivorous plant groups. There's a couple um, websites that can uh, that try to link you up with the different ones in your area. And again, I would just say to look on Facebook for for some groups there. Cool. Well, this has been Plant Daddy Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're enjoying what you hear when we do our little episodes, please give us a five-star rating. If you hate what we do, just please stop listening yes. and don't give us a rating. <laughs> I want to skew those results in our favor. Uh, but also tell your friends. If you want to be in touch, email us at plantdaddypodcast.gmail.com or check us out on social media. Basically all of those, you'll find us at Plant Daddy Podcast. We're looking forward to you tuning in next time where we're going to talk about how to grow some of these. We're going to start with the basics and that'll be a good place to get you started. So yeah, thanks for listening and happy growing. Thanks a lot.